Aloha and welcome to Think Tech and our special show dealing with the upcoming elections, which is just a few weeks away, folks. In the meantime, this episode is dedicated to Hawaii Republicans, and we've got some of the young, outstanding Republican stars with us this morning. First of all, we have from the city council, who I have now promoted to the above the state legislature. The uh, city council, we have Augie Taba, who is a council member. Good to meet, good to see you, Augie. Yeah. And of course, uh, from the state legislature, we have the head, uh, what, what is the minority leader in the floor state leader. house? Huh? Floor leader, minority floor leader. Oh, floor leader. Yeah, okay. But the leader, uh, one of the leaders of the uh, uh, in the house, Representative Diamond Garcia. Welcome, gentlemen. And in addition to that, obviously, we have with us this morning a couple of our normal pundits, if we can call them that, Colin Moore from the University of Hawaii and uh, Jay Fidel. And, you know, Jay is also uh, doing duty as our technician this morning. So anyway, um, Normally, we would have Chad Blair with us, but he's actually got a job. And so, you know, he seems to be doing it this morning. So welcome, gentlemen. Um, we're going to kick off by uh, asking either one of you to get started. Tell us why you think this is going to be a good year for the Republican Party. Uh, first of all, obviously, we're most interested in what's happening in Hawaii. But also, if you uh, want to comment on, on the national level, so which, uh, how do we start this? Diamond, you want to take it, and then I'll, you know. Okay. Sounds good. Sounds good. Well, thank you, Governor, for having us here. Um, I think this year, twenty twenty four, will, will definitely be a good year, both nationally for us. Um, it's looking good for our presidential nominee, um, and I think uh, that will help us down ballot locally to a certain extent. Um, in West Oahu, these last few election cycles, we've seen an, an increase in conservative Republican turnout, Kapole, Eva, Waipahu, the Waianae Coast, the rural areas. And I think, you know, these areas have traditionally been blue collar labor union workers, hardcore Democrat plantation eras. And so, they for decades ha have voted Democrat, but um, what we're seeing is in these areas, these middle class workers who are working and quite honestly living paycheck to paycheck, they're realizing they can no longer afford to, to, to live in Hawaii. They're watching their family, their siblings, their cousins, their aunties and uncles pack up and move to Vegas, to other red states where it's cheaper, where, where, uh, where, where the cost of living is a lot more affordable, where, where they can actually work and buy a house, that dream is uh, just not a, a reality for so many local families here in Hawaii. So I think locals uh, are realizing that voting one party is just not working. And so they're voting the other way. And, and, and I think this year and forthcoming elections, we'll see an increase in Republican victories here in Hawaii. That's uh, something to add, uh, council member? You know, as, a, as, you know, city council nonpartisan, right? And, right. you know, I have my own personal beliefs on how I see things. You know, uh, in the past, I've helped uh, as an entertainer. I've helped, you know, Democrats at functions and rallies. And by the way, thank you for that. Thank you for that. You know, I, I, I remember. I worked for Mayor Billy Kinoy. Uh, I worked for Lieutenant Governor Shan Tetsui. And, you know, what made that very special was the fact that they respected me as a person and my beliefs. So when I decided to run four years ago, I wanted to run that race because it was nonpartisan. It gave me an opportunity to listen to the community. And I've always voted that way. I've always listened to the community. And when you see and hear of a shift, you see it. When you knock on a door, you see people sharing their experience of how hard it is to make ends meet. And I understand that. I grew up in public housing. And I understand that because the day that I decided to run for office, I got fired from my job, not ever thinking that uh, it was going to be a struggle for me for a moment. 
And I was able to identify with these uh, residents in our community. You know, when I decided to take, not take the raise, you know, I get more, I had more people in my community saying, thank you, thank you. You know, and when I talk about affordable housing, or when I, when I say no to some of the spending on rail, it's not like I don't want rail. I was a very, I was, I was a big supporter in rail, but at the end of the day, my job as a public official and as a city councilman is to listen to my community and my community are, are common sense, they're tired, uh, they hate the wasteful spending that they see, and they want to see things get done in our communities. And in, in EVA, you know, people want to see clean parks. They want to see illegal parking get taken care of. But how can you do that, you know, when one, uh, the money collected by police officer all goes to the state, right? So. Crime and homelessness. So we, I'm working on working with you know uh, nonprofits, churches, and and small businesses because we hear how challenging the budget is for city, and you know we can see that people are burnt out and they're tired and they just want change. The sad thing is that out of the 800,000 registered voters, only 29 percent voted and I am I believe wholeheartedly that if that that giant percentage that don't vote came out and vote you would see change I'd like to see just some balance in government at the end of the okay. day have you know constructive uh conversations that really um talk to the people that we represent you know and listen to their concerns and not just Vote one way because you have to. So, well, that's, uh, you know, you, you got any follow up questions to that, uh, Colin? I, I have one if I could follow up with Rep Garcia. I mean, you, you, you mentioned something that I've wondered about for, for the last few election cycles, which is you do for, see this trend on the west side of Oahu moving more Republican. Um, and I guess I'm wondering when you talk to folks, is it that, you know, they're, they're really embracing the ideas of the mainland Republican Party, or is it more out of frustration? Um, and if if it's out of frustration, you know, what what are they what are they frustrated about with the Hawaii Democratic Party? I guess I'm asking you know, if you see them really being attracted to um, sort of conservative philosophies of former President Trump, or is it just that they're looking for an alternative and the Republican Party can provide them with that alternative? Yeah, well, you know, I mean, so West Oahu, these last, I would say, about a decade ha has been shifting more red. And that's prior to President Trump running for office and, and winning the presidency. Our council member out here, I mean, going back to the 90s, it was Mike Gabbard, right? I mean, his charge against same-sex marriage, Kimberly Pine, Tea Party Republican, now Andrea Topola, uh, you know, so in the nonpartisan seats, we see them electing conservatives. And so what I see is out here in, in, in West Oahu, they're, they're middle-class working families who are, who are just trying to, to survive in Hawaii. Um, I think these last eight years has really brought the whole national scene down local. So yeah, I mean, there's lots of Trump supporters out here. Um, and there's also those who don't like President Trump. I mean, but that's that's understood. But I, you know, uh, I, I think Trump won a few House districts in 2016 and 2020 here in Hawaii, and they were all in West Oahu. District 40, that was a former a rep, Bob McDermott seat. District 43, Trump won out there. Trump won the Waianae Coast in 2020. So, yeah, I mean, I think they're 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 voting Republican both nationally, but the local issues matter most to us: cost of living. Uh, jobs for, for local families, uh, those things matter. And then crime as well. The Democrats have put forward ridiculous proposals on, on issues that would actually increase crime, like no cash bail and things of that sort. And these are, you know, what, what's, what's funny is these are like wealthy Democrats who, who have these master's degrees and, and doctorate degrees. And they're talking about, you know, no cash bail because this will hurt poor people. It's the poor areas of this state which are voting Republican. It's it's the more lower income levels of this state who are actually going more, more conservative. And so 
it's interesting because during the 1990s, right, you had Hawaii Kai, Aina Haina Kailua. That was the stronghold for Republicans. Well, now that, that's all shifting. I mean, Stanley Chang is like the opposite of what, what we stand for on issues. So it's flipping now. And uh, West Oahu w- will be our stronghold for decades to come, for sure. Jay, you got something to add to uh, this conversation? Yeah, how much is, of this is affected by religion? Both you guys are into religion. Um, I guess West Oahu has a certain amount of religious emergence, if you will, maybe more than before. Uh, how much is a result of that? Anybody? Okay. Uh, you know, again, as a candidate that never had money to send out flyers in my first front in office, I went door to door. You know, by the time the pandemic hit, I had already done 40,000 doors. Like, like I knew that I had to work hard, but in all of the questions asked, they would ask me, well, are you a Christian? And yeah, uh, Augie, you know, Augie, we like, didn't well, hear your, Augie, we didn't uh, hear your answer. Okay, yeah, you we lost the answer again. Oh, sorry. I said like, you know, as a, as a candidate that didn't have enough money to send out flyers, I had to go door to door. So, you know, before the pandemic hit, I had already walked 40,000 homes. And when I went door to door, that's one of the questions they would ask, are you a Christian? And, you know, it's kind of questions that normally I don't get asked, but it gave me a sense of who am I talking to? You know, uh, they knew me as a comic, but they wanted to know whether or not I go to church, which is kind of interesting, you know, uh, so I would say, yeah, I think it's influenced a lot. A lot of them are minorities, Polynesians uh, that, you know, uh, go to church and go to church religiously. So I would have to say. Well, Donna, what's your answer to that? Yeah, well, definitely. I think the, the three core issues and pillars for us out here is faith, family and freedom. These issues, I mean, uh, having uh, candidates that, that 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 have that faith foundation is very important. Um, I often remind folks of our, our state model, and we're the only state in, in the whole country that talks about righteousness in our own model. The life of this land is perpetuated in righteousness. And so I think I'll hear people uh, in West Oahu, they're, they're in with our state motto, they they want to see a government that moves forward in righteous ways. Um, let me ask the, the question, you know, now traditionally, for example, on the neighbor islands, uh, you, if you had West Hawaii versus East Hawaii, I'm talking big island now, right? I mean, basically the people in Kona didn't like anybody in Hilo. And so they, they, you know, they voted, and Hilo was all Democrat. In fact, Hilo was spoiled by the Democratic uh, administrations over the years. I mean, the airport went there, the university went there, even if the tourist was going to the other side of the island. You know what I'm saying? And um, but on a national politics. Uh, you know, there were a lot of the people in Kona were actually uh, voting Democratic. So what you're suggesting is that that idea of just resentment of the Waianae Coast, Waianae had elected Republicans in the past, you know, in, you know and they they had a tendency to change all, <laughs> change um, parties once they got elected, but uh, but it was kind of Anti Honolulu it was anti what the every you know what they considered the establishment. Uh, is that still part of this, or is this a completely new? I mean, it's interesting to me as a political, uh, you know, uh, person that 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 they that they might be something here that we don't we that wasn't uh, obvious in the past. If I may, just quickly, uh, you know, it's. It, yeah, I think there is a portion of this anti-establishment feeling in locals out here against the the big city guys in Honolulu. But nowadays, I mean, people are in town almost every day, right? So, I mean, we're, 
we we mix around and hang out with people across the state. So I don't think it's more of an anti Honolulu feel, more of just an anti big government feel. Folks out here just want a smaller government, leave us alone, stop taxing us so much, let us live our life in peace and let us worship how we want to worship and raise our kids how we want to raise our kids. Quite honestly, Governor, I was watching one of your uh, your uh, state of the state speeches back in the 80s. And I can say, you know, if you gave that same speech today, people would call you a Republican. You advocated for a, a, a massive income tax reduction. You advocated for elected school boards across the state. I was like, wow, this sounds like the minority caucus package this year. So, you know, I think over time, the parties have actually changed because the, the Democratic Party of, of the 1960s is not the same party today. It, it, it just really isn't. So, you know, and I guess, and would that be true also of the Republican Party? Yeah, for sure. <laughs> We're no longer the, the Bush country club Republicans. I think under Trump's administration, he's transformed the party to the party of the working class. Wow. Any questions? Any follow up, gentlemen? Yeah. I just wanted to say, you know, on the on the lines of like um, looking down upon our side of the island and looking at Honolulu a certain way, you know, I think people on our side of the island feel neglected, and all you have to do is just ask them about the parks. You know, when you hear. Mayor Blanchardi say, you know, you got to take back your community. And I know what he was saying. I know what he was saying. And, you know, you can easily get mad if all you heard was no to a lot of stuff. No to, you know, when it comes to city issues. And I knew what he was getting. And that's kind of what we're doing in Waipahu. But, like, we're doing it, like, you know, gener um, generically, where we're trying to really build uh, a coalition together, but like I knew what he was saying, but that's what happens when for so long people just feel neglected, and that's that's I think the biggest cause of why people like change. We, we just feel neglected. Just look at our parks, look at what's happening along the west side when it comes to violence, and like, hey, take a look, we're out here too, and people think I think they just want change. I want to see something different. Jay, you seem to be anxious, so you got something to contribute? Yeah, uh, I, I think the elephant in the room is, is Trump and the GOP and the MAGAs. Uh, you know, the, the general vision you described, Diamond, sounds an awful lot like the national GOP. And although 29% voted last time, I suggest to you guys that there's a lot of people just like all of us who are watching the show every day, call it a reality show in Washington. And we're getting all this news on one side or the other. So people will vote. Augie, I think it'll be way more than 29% because they're following it on okay. the national level. And Diamond, you know, you say that all politics is local, but the fact is that when they go to the ballot booth, they have two names in mind, Trump and, and Harris. That's what they start with. And whether they vote for you, you know, is really secondary for all those people who have been spending all their time watching the reality show. Um, so my question to you, maybe both of you, is how much of an effect is the national election between Trump and Harris having on your positions, on the GOP here, and on your constituents? Well, I can, yes. Yeah, my, my, my not going to be long, Diamond. I think you have perspective because on the state side, you know, for me, you know, even when I'm doing radio, I'm like, how does that affect what's going on here in our island? We still got to deal with traffic. We still got to deal with looking at something that's empty that we, that we use over $500 million in perpetuity. I mean, we cannot even talk about it. People are frustrated. I don't think it's already I mean, which is which is sad for me because as soon as people found out I was Republican, they automatically just kind of aligned me with like, oh, you just this ugly guy because you're Republican. And that's not even the case. Not even the case. So I don't think, honestly, this, this is just me. I don't know how the reality show that we're watching um, 
makes people when they're driving in their cars. I don't think they're. I don't think they've been thinking about that reality show. They're just thinking about, and I gotta get to work. Uh, and it's a small. It's a small group of people that's wow. Believe me. In the 30 years of doing entertainment, no one ever heckled me. No one ever did anything. As soon as I ran for office, because I was friends with a Republican guy, I was getting cracks from every direction. And I was like, where's this coming from? Where's this coming from? So I think there's a small percentage of people that's loud and crazy. And there's a lot of people just not even paying attention because they're working two, three jobs. And the price of paradise is sitting down in the toilet looking at the beautiful painting of a beach. <laughs> and, you know, we as public officials don't try our best to, like, be that concern. I don't, I don't think they... Hey, by the way, I'm going to steal that line, you know, that's a bit of... <laughs> yeah, you know, but uh, just following up on that, though, uh, and maybe this is the diamond, because I, I know that at one point in time, you sort of were uh, in charge of the party, or the, the Republican Party and its organization. And um, it seems like this year, so it's not only about the west side of Oahu, but this year, there seems to be uh, more candidates running. One of the things, well, there were two problems for Republicans operationally in the past. First of all, the National Party never paid attention to it. So you couldn't get any support. So my first part of the question would be, are you getting support? And the second part of the question, uh, what, and again, it has to do with the party organization, is that uh, Democrat, the action was always on the Democratic primary because there were no, there was not enough candidates running uh, uh, from the Republican Party. Now, uh, this is to contrast, really, in, in the, the 70s, uh, when I think I, I heard one point, there was at least a third, uh, maybe as much as almost 40% of the legislature, which was from the opposition party. But in those days, you actually had contested races. So is this election any better than what was in the past? So, uh, or, or how is this? How are yeah. both of these issues being addressed? Right, right. So to your first point, yes, we are getting help nationally as far as technology, resources for canvassing, for, for data points and all that stuff. But they also realized that Hawaii is a pretty solidly blue state. Now, I can say this. I don't think Hawaii is a progressive state. I think Hawaii is a blue state because there's very low voter turnout. And it's the, the, the consistent Democratic voters who are coming out to vote, and that's what makes it a solidly blue state. But if you were to factor in the entire 800,000 registered voters, I think the vast majority of them have conservative values. Now, unfortunately, the party hasn't put forward many candidates because the candidate recruitment is not the easiest. Uh, two years ago, I was vice chair of the party under Lynn Finnegan, and I was vice chair of candidate recruitment. We had the largest recruitment effort in our, our party's recent history in, in a 2022. And from that election, we, we actually swept a bunch of West Oahu seats, Brenton Oahu on the North Shore and a few other council races as well. So there's there's movement there, there for sure. But I think um, moving forward, you, you will see more Republicans running because now there's actual Republicans in elected office who are now echoing their sentiments, and that and that's inspiring them to actually get involved and run for office. So, what races across the state do you have uh, some hope for? I mean, outside of Oahu, I'm talking about. Yeah, well, well, so right now we're we're trying to increase incrementally, and right now they're they're definitely Oahu seat. We're looking at taking up the the other Waianae seat that's being vacated by Rep. Cedric Gates. It's a conservative area. Trump did did, did very well numbers wise out there. So it's winnable for us. Uh, the Salt Lake Amonalua seat with uh, our candidate Garner Shimizu, who's running against Micah Ayu, you know, that uh, he actually lost that race by about 200 votes last time. And that area has traditionally voted, oh, it's it's really purple. Bob, uh, Bob McDermott had it, uh, Lynn Finnegan had it, Aaron Johansson had it. So it, it, it goes back and forth. So we're hoping to actually 
pick up that seat. And then also the District 40 seat in Eva Beach with Julie Ray's Oda, we're hoping to win that one as well. So we do plan to increase incrementally. Uh, it, it's not going to happen overnight, um, but the the main thing is if we can get local people to actually engage in government, we will actually start seeing a lot of increases. But also the, these last few years, I think what's really helped people like Augie, Brenton, myself is social media. We, uh, we've we been able to to utilize social media, Instagram, and some of our, our floor speeches, committee uh, hearing speeches, uh, and just conversations can, can go viral. Whereas, you know, 30 years ago, we'd have to issue a press release and, and pray to God that the liberal bias media covers us correctly. But now that's just not the case. We can go r- right to the people immediately. You can come to think that. <laughs> exactly. There you go. <laughs> anyway, yeah. You know, but, that, but that's really interesting because, you know, I, I my belief is that Republicans have always done well in nonpartisan races. Because especially on the on the county level in, in in general, as they are now, I mean, there are people who believe that this this city government, which you know, like the mayor who I'm support, I, I believe is a great mayor, and and others, are actually uh, could be uh, could be considered uh, red, you know, or at least purple uh, in terms of the majority. So they, they do because they. The one thing about the nonpartisan races is they get away from the social issues. So you're not dealing with uh, putting an amendment on the ballot uh, to remove the discretion to define marriage from the legislature, for example. And uh, I had, in my own experience, um, there used to be uh, Ann Kobayashi. She was Republican. John A. Cato was Republican, Virginia Isabel, this is during my time. And all of them were, I would describe them as social liberals, but uh, but fiscal conservatives. And all of them changed parties when the social issues became uh, much more dominant in the Republican Party. So uh, is any of that affecting, uh, Augie, anything? I, I, you know, being 56 and always voted since I was 18 years old, I think that's what you hear all the time. You like win in Hawaii, you got to be Democrat, and it's 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 been slipped to me. Like if you're thinking about running for higher office, you got to run as a Democrat. I don't think so. After doing council now for four years, I think people, if you sit down, you listen to them, and you, you take the time to explain your views, you have more common ground, and I think people would be okay if you just stayed what you believe in. I mean, that's why government is so awesome. That's why I loved it because I believe that laws are created so that you and I can have fruitful conversation and, you know, we can live harmoniously. It's just, you know, when social media is awesome, but I still think in Hawaii, a one-on-one contact, looking at somebody in the eye and just explaining your views. You know whether it's well, you know Democrat or Republican. Is there you know, is you know, there a difference in the acceptance, though, yeah. of messages in the sense that, um, you know, I think a lot of people in Hawaii are essentially conservative, right? Yep. And, and and when when you're dealing with issues that are bread and butter, um, and the like, the conservative message may have a broader appeal than uh, issues that are currently uh, in social issues that really uh, come up every once in a while. But I, I was curious to know whether you sense a change in that, that people actually are also starting to get just as attractive. Uh, I, I don't know, um, I'm, but I am curious. Well, I'm... Because, uh, because I think I think the, your, your your message uh, this morning, um, re- yeah, you could have you know you could have worked uh, in my cabinet, but uh, you know, uh, but we're not talking about 
I mean, look at look at what the, the social issues we went through. We're not talking about choice. We're not talking about um, things like uh, marriage, a definition of marriage. We're not talking about uh, the ability, you know, when uh, uh, the right to commit suicide, if you want that, you want to do it that way. Are those issues beginning now? Back in the day, the Republican position which I didn't espouse and uh, uh, made me, I guess, a Democrat, was the death penalty. Mm. Uh, poor people always, people, I don't think the average politician realizes that when you're dealing with crime, the people who are mostly affected by crime live in a poor neighborhood. And so there, I mean, I those are the guys who want the strictest laws. I used to represent Kali, you know, and I used to have to deal with uh, whether or not we should uh, have the death penalty all the time. Now, personally, I, I didn't like it because I didn't trust the system. But um, anyway, well, is that changing? Is there more? Is Are, are people looking for more than economics? Yeah. You know, the... The social issues of back in the day, I think, yeah, was marriage, abortion, and that was, and and then the the assisted suicide issue. Today, as of right now, I think the main issue that's at the forefront is parental rights and what's happening in the schools. Mm -hmm. uh, because, you know, parents just, you know, during COVID-19, people were, were locked at home and they began to watch their kids do school online. And they're like, wait a minute, what is this stuff that they're learning at schools and it was against their values. And so parents began to rise up across the country. We saw states like Virginia flip red with, with uh, Glenn Youngkin and their, their main issue was parental rights. Parents have a fundamental right to raise the kids the way they want. And the government can't step in and, and tell, and then, and then even threaten parents like in California and Washington and Oregon. If a parent objects to a, a child going on hormone blockers, for example, the state in some uh, states, they're, they're, they're threatening parental custody over their kids. That is not going to sit well with, with local families here in Hawaii. Hawaii has conservative values, but more importantly, it's family values. Ohana, the family unit is a sacred thing, and government doesn't have a right to, to tell parents what to do. And so I think that that social issue is at the forefront right now. Not so much abortion. I mean, right now, abortion nationally is a big issue because the Democrats are making it an issue. But um, here in Hawaii, I think uh, the the main issue is parental rights and a school curriculum. Wow. You know, we are we are keeping these fine gentlemen longer than, than over time because they're I, extremely interesting guests. So I I'm going to give each of you a chance to ask your last questions. Um, Starting with uh, uh, probably this time, I, I'll, I'll go with Jay first, and then you can close it, uh, uh, Colin. So, Jay, you got anything you want to add or put into? Yeah, well, you know, if they stay on this... any longer, you know, I might start wearing red. So, you know, you, you hurry up. <laughs> not, it won't be that long, John. <laughs> <laughs> So, you know, Diamond, uh, you know, there's so many questions come out of what you said. But, um, you know, if politics is local, then my interests are local, me personally, my home, my family and so forth. And when I see all these shootings in Waianae, that's your district, isn't it? Um, uh, no, I'm Kapolei Eva, but I'm from Waianae. So, yeah. And, okay. and I lived in Waianae for almost 16 years. So, yeah, it's very disheartening. It's disheartening, but, you know, people who are not necessarily in Waianae, and that, and that includes legislators who know Waianae but actually don't represent Waianae, um, have got to be concerned that all these senseless killings and shootings and, and guns and gun violence that we read about in, in the mainland and in Europe, for that matter, um, you know, are, are going to have a creeping effect into other neighborhoods other situations. And I I really am concerned about that. That's where I live. I live in other neighborhoods. And I don't want anybody coming around with guns and shooting people in Hawaii. It was never thus before, but now the threat is there. 
So what can your respective legislative bodies do to stop this cold? I know that the GOP you know, is, favors the Second Amendment and opposes gun control. Uh, all the GOP members on the mainland do that. I'm not sure how you guys feel about it. But if it was me, I would stop it cold. What is your position on that? What is your concern? What kind of comfort can you give me? Yeah, so for, for West Oahu, you know, it, it's just a sad reality to see this, this massive increase in gun violence. This is last three weeks. There's been three shootings and, and death has occurred in all of those shootings. But here's the reality, guys. Passing more stricter gun laws is not going to solve the problem. The problem isn't in legislation. Chicago has the strictest gun laws nationwide, and they have shootings left and right, sometimes 60 a weekend. So that's not going to solve the problem. It's a heart issue. It's a family issue. It's a, a foundational issue. What is, your, what is your, your moral foundation, your moral compass? What is parents, and are they instilling values in their children? in their families. That's really the, the heart of the issue. All these gun violent instances have been happening with illegal firearms. So you, so you can pass all the laws you want. These criminals are not going to follow your strict gun laws. They're, they're ghost guns. Lots of them out here are ghost guns. They're illegal firearms. This instance in Waianae Valley that just happened, the guy who, who rammed those, those people and then shot them, his firearm was an unregistered illegal firearm. It was the homeowner who had a registered legal firearm that used his weapon the right way to defend his family and kill the suspect. And so that is what the Second Amendment is for. It's to protect ourselves, our families, and they should be in the hands of responsible law-abiding citizens. And you know, 100 years ago, there was a lot more guns on the street, but less deaths. Now, there's probably less guns out there, but there's more violence. So the issue isn't laws and guns. The issue is an issue with the people with mental illness right now that's going on. Okay, Colin, you got the sh a shot. And All right, let me, out real quick. let me ask you guys a question on, on an issue where I think Republicans have always been strong in this state, which is anti-corruption and transparency. Um, you know, I think that a lot of people can agree that there is an, an arrogance to the Hawaii Democratic Party and unaccountability. And I guess I'm wondering what what are the changes you'd like to see made and how much when you go out and talk to folks, you know, is that an issue that they want to see changes in governance? They want less corruption, more transparency. I mean, does that come up as much as the bread and butter cost of living issues and, and things like that? Uh, you know, I'll, I'll answer that. I, I think I think transparency. Um, you know, for me, people doubted everything that I did when I decided to run. Yeah, popular, he knows. But like one of the things that I wanted to do and I got great advice from amazing people that I worked for was that that transparency. You know, people want to be educated as I'm being educated. I'm not a politician. I went in, you know, um, bright eye, bushy tail. You know, I love living in Hawaii. I saw my mom and dad having to move in with me, even despite them working all their lives. And I have children that, you know, cannot afford to buy their own home. So the same challenges or the same things we hear every two or four years, you know, uh, finally for me was like important that I go and use my celebrity the right way. And I think it's worked for me, Colin, being transparent and being open being honest and not pandering. Um, so, Jay, when you hear about all those shootings out in y and I, I bet if we took a stat, it's probably the same maybe percentage, but now it's so glamorized because of social media and media. Uh, I think, again, what Damon was saying, I think, you know, we got to be transparent. We got to educate the public. We got to fix our school system. We have to work on um, ge generational trauma. Because if you talk to the people that work out in the correctional, they'll tell you they are arresting the same kids that their fathers, they arrested their fathers, their grandparents. So, you know, transparency is important because I think people are okay if you make a mistake. I think people are okay if you tell them the truth. Sometimes the truth hurts, 
But I think in this day and age, people need to know that everything that we're getting and learning, it should be out there. And it helped. And it worked for me. You know what I mean? Uh, I could have easily not say anything about the raise, but I was, but I heard from my community. And I just never like live with that. And I go to the same store as everybody else. I go to the same events like everybody else. And people are having a very difficult time. Instead of lying to them and sugarcoating everything, let them know. And this is tough times. And we and if you want change, you got to vote. You got to vote and you got to talk to the Any, any uh, quick remarks, uh, Diamond? Last you know, remark. I agree. I agree. Um, you know, the, the fact about is, transparency and all of that. Yep, yep. And so people want transparency. I know the, these last few years, the issue with the, the DOIs, the, the corruption and stuff like that, you know, I think that, that hit home for West Oahu. And uh, people were just sick of the establishment and they want transparent leaders. So, yeah, I mean, if you make a mistake, hey, just own up to it. Apologize. I think that that would have got, gone over a lot better than than lying, lying to the people about it. And so people just don't like to be lied to. And um, unfortunately, there, there's been one party in rule for 70 years and there's been lots of corruption there. So we're going to keep pressing forward and trying to, to restore good governance here in Hawaii on both the state and county levels. And we look forward to having a healthy and vibrant two-party system. Well, we look forward to having you back on the program, both of you. And uh, probably maybe a after the elections, and you can tell us whether you succeeded or not. But uh, thank you so much for this morning, gentlemen. Thank we you appreciate God. your presence. We appreciate your candor and, uh, and your willingness to uh, with to share your time with us. So with that, aloha, and um, <laughs> you can uh, go about uh, your campaigning. Um, I know there's a I know there's a house out there who's waiting for you to go and come by and shake their hands. So aloha, right. everybody. Right. Thanks, Thank Diamond. You. Thank you, uh, Augie. Yeah. Aloha. What do you think? If I was a Democrat, I'd be nervous. And I am a Democrat. <laughs> I mean, I think we've had two of the most articulate Republicans on the state on, on the program. And I mean, I think they represent slightly different sides of the party. I mean, Augie is more clearly more of a center right, nonpartisan Republican. And I mean, I, Diamond is closer to a committed, um, committed Republican, which makes sense. I mean, he's in a partisan office. But, you know, Diamond said something that I've, I've said a lot, too. And I, I think we all share this idea that Hawaii, there's a lot of conservative values here. There's a lot of people who hold those conservative values. I think that Diamond really hit the nail on the head where he said things, things, so many things are about family, and that's where they can focus their their um, you know, why some of these social issues uh, have traction here. I've always thought it was really a branding issue. Um, you know, and I don't know if they really had a great answer to how they're gonna try to to shift that, but um, you know, like you said, and when we started this program, Governor, I mean, conservative candidates do well here, but Republican candidates don't. Yeah, Jay? I, I totally agree with that. And I totally agree also with the fact that they're, they're good representatives for the Republican Party. The, the problem is that a lot of what they said, especially Diamond, uh, is, is just a repetition of what the Republican Party is saying on the mainland. I get a little confused, you know. Um, you know, leave us alone. We don't want big government, and yes, we do want government uh, to protect family and all that. So I'm not sure where that's going, but I, I must say that he's very articulate, and the two of them have thought of a way to present at least parts of the GOP platform uh, to the Hawaii public, uh, where it won't be obnoxious. Um, because they, they run the risk, both of them, in adopting GOP positions, conservative positions, if you will, they run the risk of alienating an awful lot of people. On the other hand, I would I'd like to say that West Oahu has a fair number of conservative and Trump voters. Why? Why would West Hawaii, uh, West Hawaii be any different? I think part of it is uh, the military is out there. We talked about this before. Um, part of it is this alienation, uh, and I think that this program covered that. 
uh, yeah. alienated from the Democrats, alienated from the power brokers who, who run the legislature and the state. So Colin, you were going to add something? Yeah, I, I think, I mean, I, I agree with Jay. I, I, I think it's a combination of factors, right? I think there's the religious element. I think social issues drive some of those voters. Um, you know, I, I think there are some committed Republicans out there. Um, I think, but I think a, a big group of those voters are people who feel alienated. I mean, what what Diamond said, you know, these are largely working class communities um, who I think feel alienated from the power structures in Honolulu and certainly in the rest of the country feel left out. Um, you know, that's where we've seen this shift throughout the whole country. Um, those voters. I'm a little surprised it's happened as much in Hawaii. I mean, because I think a lot of those voters out there are also union members. I mean, we have the highest rate of union membership in the country right now. Um, and I'm surprised that, I mean, and there must be a, a big chunk of those voters who are union members who are now voting Republican. And that's that's something I have a little more difficult time. Do well, you think about. they'll split the ticket? Again. Do you think, they'll, they'll, you know, based on both of your analysis, would you think that you think that those types of voters are going to split the ticket in the sense that that if their union, for example, with collective bargaining, and I mean, you don't have to worry about that ever being challenged here. Yeah. But I'm sure you got a national union who's scared stiff that if the Republicans took over everything nationally, uh, they'll start losing those rights. So, is it? Is there? Uh, is there going to be? a possibility of a split voting where you would vote against the establishment uh, in uh, Hawaii, but say, look, I I'm going to vote with, uh, I'm, I'm going to vote with Democratic uh, National. Is any of that uh, possible? I think it's possible. I mean, I think you're going to see voters in those districts who are who might who are likely to support Harris, but also will vote for Diamond Garcia um, because they like they like that perspective. They, I mean, I think some voters can rightfully say, "Look, we think it's healthy to have these voices in the legislature." I think it is too. I'm glad they're there. Um, yeah, me too. I think I, I'm. I mean, I don't individual. I'm not talking about any individual election. Sure, but I think the idea of having uh, a um, an opposition party that's effective. Actually strengthens the hand of the uh, of the Democrats. I mean, look at you know the problem with having a legislature that is so one sided uh, is that you can't do what Dickie Wong did in 1980, I guess, which is that we you know discipline his party by making a coalition. And that's the question we didn't we didn't ask of. Maybe we're too polite to ask, but I mean, I guess that was one question I would have asked, which is how effectively are you are you disciplining your party members? I mean, I think one of the big problems with the Hawaii Republicans over the last decade or so or longer is that there's just been constant infighting. I mean, they're always fighting with each other as much. Oh yeah, they they Democrats the Democrats, have, Democrats have won more elections because the Republicans fell apart than any other reason. Especially in the last twenty years or so, mm -hmm. uh, and, and but you know, here's a case. And since that talked about, I, I'll throw this point out to both of you. I mean, you've got Kanani Souza, right? I think she's the she's a Republican now. She's yeah. running unopposed in the general election, and she won her Republican primary. But she made a big issue out of never go, of not being part of the Republican caucus. She called them a cult. Yeah, she called the, the you know, uh, uh, the, the current Republicans a cult. So, yeah, that's, uh, I wonder how much of that, no, the, you know, Democrats, but then Will Rogers said that a long time ago, you know, I'm a Democrat, I don't belong to any organized party. You know? uh, but uh, I don't well, know. I think, I think their challenge, and it, it, it was clear in uh, Diamond's remarks, is to try to find a platform um, that will work in Hawaii um, without um, without seeming to follow some of the machinations we see in the Republican and Trump platform on the mainland. And I think he has trouble with that. Hard to, I think the party, the Republican Party right now has, has have, does include some cultish uh, tendencies from the national side. And I think that if you're 
if you're uh, accepting national aid, you probably got to be, you got to probably walk a certain line. Uh, and uh, to a point. But I think the people, Democrats ought to pay attention to the fact that nonpartisan races, Republicans do very well. Or people who are not traditionally known as Democrats do pretty well. Yeah. None of the issues that, that he was talking about or skirting around, I don't think they're going to work in Hawaii. I mean, I, I felt there was a certain softness in his what he was saying on on the social issues, abortion, for example. Um, it was clearly a softness um, on the gun violence issue when he said was it's all it's all in the family. It's mental illness. Um, I wouldn't buy that. A lot of people would not buy. A lot of reasonable people, even conservative reasonable people, are not going to buy. He's mouthing um, the GOP position on the mainland. And so if he went into the legislature and tried to get some initiative going on some of those issues, you're not going to get anywhere. And he's not going to have a following. And he's not going to get other people to go, go along with him, on, on, frankly, on either side of the aisle. So he's got to, you know, reconcile if he's going to be successful, if the remnants of the Republican Party are going to be successful after this election. Uh, they got to present things that, and I'm not talking about political here, things that are good for the community. I, I, I've had conversations with Diamond when I, I remind him that actually there is a series of Republicans who are really heroes in, in Hawaii. Obviously, the you know the one obviously that everybody we even have a holiday named after me, Neil, right? And 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 one of the things that um, the Republican Party is probably doing right now, which is the Democrats uh, may not have been more successful on. Now that's because they're the ruling party, so to speak. So they they actually have to pass something, but the Republicans are. Are, are really uh, playing with this with Hawaiian issues, mm -hmm. and and, uh, and 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 they're attracting a lot of people uh, to the, to what they're doing with Hawaiian homes and, and the rest, and uh, and and it's a good issue to take on because um, you know no we, we sure as haven't been very successful with it. I mean, the Democrats have. But I think that's absolutely right, John. That's part of the divisiveness. It's it's part of the disenchantment. Well, it's also part of we've got to wake up too. Yeah. I mean, I don't think that that's just a Republican. I mean, I mean, that's you know, that, and another hero is Pat Psyche. Mm -hmm. She's Congresswoman. I mean. Pat Psyche actually talked the U.S. president into stopping the bombing of Kaho Olavi. It wasn't, he happened to be a Republican, which was Bush, but, uh, you know, she, she did it. Hiram Fong. Hiram Fong was, a, was actually, um, uh, actually endorsed by labor in Hawaii when he was running for the United States Senate. And he, really is the father of Asian immigration to America. I mean, th these are examples that you could localize and use that would be a, a kind of a counterweight to what you see Trump uh, may be running. The reason why I, I say some of this stuff is, you know, he reminded me that all these Republicans that are now voting for him, at least the numbers in the districts used to vote for me. <laughs> and well, you know, and by the way, Frank Fossey. Sure. But, and, and they voted for Fossey for years when he was a Democrat or Republican or an Independent. So there's something about uh, you know all of that. I, I don't know what it is yet, but uh, it's, it's. I think I think if I was if I was. Um, still running for office, I'd start paying attention to some of these trends that may be different than when I was running. John, don't you think that um, part of this could be resolved if more Democratic candidates took more middle-of-the-road positions 
um, mm -hmm. and tried to be more moderate, even more conservative. Well, most of them are pretty moderate. Or I mean, most of them are. You know, in yeah. fact, I had this conversation with Representative Gene Ward one time, and I think Diamond was there, and and he, he as his aide. And uh, and I, I I told Gene I said the problem that you have Gene with rebuilding the Republican Party is they're all Democrats. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. I, I mean, you talk to the progressives and they want to say the same thing. We, you know, they have this this belief which I find kind of crazy that there's you know this huge all this support for these far left positions in Hawaii. And I'm always wondering where, where do you think, you know, who are you talking to? I really don't see that that's, that's the case at all. Um, you know, it's a, it's, it's uh, the Democrats are centrist because that's pretty much a reflection of public opinion. Suppose Trump wins or takes, takes power again, somehow after November 5th. Um, what, what effect does that have on Hawaii? Um, does it mean that the Republican Party here is stronger, weaker? Weaker. Um, I think it will be weaker because I, I think the national uh, an, an administration headed by Trump is not going to remember the little people who was help, were helping him in Hawaii if, if he's true to his normal uh, modus operandi. Yeah. That, you know, he may be pushing issues that individually people might feel attractive, but in general, uh, <laughs> in general, that's not going to sit well with us. In fact, I, you know, I, I, I think that it'll probably be in the long run even bad for the Republic. But anyway, gentlemen, thank you. We had a great and exciting show. Uh, we are right at the edge of the uh, this uh, morning's <laughs> I don't know what you call pontifications. And uh, so I'm going to give you a, a second chance. Uh, you, you can, uh, either way, who wants to go first? Uh, all right, Jay, you go first. Colin, you get to end it. All right. I think the Republicans, as expressed through um, the two guests, uh, Diamond Garcia and uh, uh, Augie Tolbo, uh, have some good points. And the notion of transparency and another hand clapping, if you will, is attractive. And actually, I think more attractive now than it was a few years ago for a variety of reasons. And if they get together and organize good positions, positions that will be, you know, appreciated by a larger group, not just the, you know, the right wing group, but a larger group, they could have a future in Hawaii. Um, I'm not sure. Uh, that's going to happen. And if it doesn't happen, I think these guys uh, are going to be stranded out there, you know, on the branch of the tree that is ultimately going to go nowhere. Um, so that's the question. The other question is whether the Democrats hear this conversation, whether they realize they have to pay attention, as you pointed out. Bob? I think the Democrats have heard this. I mean, I think you've seen this from the move to deregulate housing permits to to reduce taxes. I mean, I think that this is filtering through to some degree. The thing I don't really always understand about the Republicans in partisan office is why they why they still feel the need to connect themselves much to the mainland party at all. Their strongest issues are cost of living, anti-corruption, all local issues. They strong... just lose the, the, the MAGA baggage and they do I think they do much better. Is it possible to do that? Can they lose the MAGA baggage? That sounds like a hard one. Yeah, it maybe it, it it could be hard. I mean, because the brand is so connected to it. Yeah, and it could be hard because that's the cost of support. Mm -hmm. In fact, there was a Republican candidate. Uh, I I don't want to name names, but there was a Republican candidate that actually won congressional seat for a short period of time, and then went to. Um, went to Congress and voted against, voted along with the with the Republicans on three issues that actually hurt Hawaii mm -hmm. and hurt his campaign, hurt his real campaign. And uh, he, uh, we, I was uh, in, a, in a situation and talking to his uh, 
one of his managers and ask him why was that happening? And it was the price of getting support for the general uh, or for the upcoming elections. So yeah, there's always that. Uh, and you know, by the way, um, this idea of the National Party not supporting the local Republicans is uh, it's, it's true. I mean, if they're doing it now, it'd be, it's a big difference. But yeah. you know, that's the Democrats. I mean, the De you know, it was great that we have a few labor unions that make some, you know, all of that stuff. The national, I think Tip O'Neill was right. Then that would be my last point today. You know, all politics. Local, and you're not going to get a majority until you, you realize. So, with that, gentlemen, thank you very much. And we want to thank again our guests this morning and, uh, and tell the audience out there that we'll be back in uh, at least a couple of weeks. So, look forward to it. Aloha, everybody. And this is Think Tech Hawaii.